getting better all the time I used to get mad at my school The teachers had taught me when cool So why did you write it? Did you have personal experience with goalkeeping? Yeah, I had a lot of personal experience um, at, at a fairly basic level. My father was a goalkeeper and he played in goal for the army um, during the Second World War as the British Army, uh, with the American Army, advanced up the leg of Italy all the way from Sicily to the far north um, in the advance in the early 40s. As and when a town was liberated, he'd be playing with the army team on the local football pitch. And he'd have played on many of the famous grounds, um, Florence, Milan, uh, Bologna. He played in the Olympic Stadium uh, in Rome. Of course, this was at a time when it was all abandoned during the war, but that's where the British Army team played. And he'd tell me about this. Um, I played for the school. Um, nobody volunteered to be a goalkeeper. Um, I got in the school team by volunteering. Then I found I could do it reasonably well and uh, eventually got a trial for uh, Late Orient um, and played in their boys team for about um, uh, two to three seasons. Um, so there's a fair bit of background. Also, I spent a lot of time going to Highbury, the part of London I come from, watching the Arsenal play. And given that Arsenal in that period... 50s, 60s, early 70s weren't particularly good. The goalkeeper got lots of practice, so I saw a lot was, uh, what was going on. Who was the? Who was your favourite goalkeeper of, of those? Initially, of those early teams? yeah, initially the it was Jack Kelsey, uh, the Welsh international, whose career was unfortunately cut short in a bad accident during a game against Brazil. The Brazilians loved him. Um, he'd played against them. Um, in the 1958 World Cup finals in Sweden, Wales, the only, the only finals they've qualified for. And Kelsey was the difference and um, was voted man of the match against Brazil, an extraordinary game. And they invited, the Brazilians invited Wales to go to Brazil afterwards to play more games as a result of his performance. Unfortunately, in one of them, he got so badly injured he could never play again. He was the man that I watched initially, Bob Wilson, wonderfully consistent goalkeeper at Arsenal, and then of course you had the opportunity to see all the others, the Gordon Bankses, the Peter Bonettis, the Pat Jennings of course, who for me was one of the greatest goalkeepers ever, the Peter Schmeichels eventually. So um, I was able to watch an awful lot of at Highbury with, with my background coming from that area. I used to meet them in personal surrounds, should see that the, you know, the, the heroic, iconic footballer was actually an ordinary guy. Jack Kelsey, for example, smoked quite heavily, had nicotine stained fingers. You got to see that these people weren't just sorry, gods, they were ordinary people, uh, which I found particularly interesting, you know, getting into the psyche of goalkeeping and things like that. Do you think that inspired, that made it more attainable when you were a young sort of Orient trainee? Absolutely. And, and the unattainable team then, as now, was Manchester United um, into the early 60s, although they weren't performing particularly well. Um, they had had the Munich air crash, um, which of course, well, Manchester United were already a big team before that. But for me, the goalkeeper of the hour was Harry Gregg, who had pulled people out of the flaming wreckage at Munich. It survived, and he, play, he was playing within a couple of days. And sort of great, hard character, Northern Irish international. And I, in those days, you could run on the field and get autographs before the start of a game. Now it's a criminal offence, of course, to even sort of think about putting your foot on the on the turf. But I ran on one day the length of the entire pitch and got down to the goal mouth and stood in the goal mouth with Harry Gregg in the five minute kick around that they used to have before a game started. 70,000 people watching and of course I had the impression they were watching me. You got Bobby Charlton banging the ball in and Harry Gregg standing there signing my autograph book. You, you'd get to sort of talk to them a little bit. You get to see how friendly and ordinary normal people they could be. And that did make it more attainable. They weren't quite, because they'd come down from the position of gods, it was possible to imagine you could do it. It was another thing when you got between the posts and tried to do it yourself. It's a very difficult position to play in, a great position to play in, very difficult. I made it so far, then eventually was told, sorry son, you're not going to make it. But I was glad to have got the distance I did. Well, perhaps you never would have written this book if you'd uh, made it in football. No, no, I'd probably been like so many other people going to the football, um, downplayed any uh, sort of literary interest. I was in the late Norian dressing room in the 60s and taking my O-levels. There was only one other boy that was still at school after the age of 15 then. And he came back in with five O-levels. His results came through and I was sort of patting him on the back, congratulating him. And he was saying, no, 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 keep it quiet, keep it quiet. We don't want anybody else in the dressing room to know. <laughs> 
It wasn't, shall we say, an area which encouraged stringing a sentence together, a very friendly sort of background. Um, no, I was able, as a result of being told, being given a distance away from the game, being told I wasn't going to make it, I could sort of think a bit more and eventually come around to writing something about it. There's an interesting passage in the book when you talk about a game that you played in Mexico City with um, the likes of uh, Rivellino. Uh, do you want to just talk a little bit about that, you know, in terms of meeting your gods and playing with, you know, <laughs> that was kind of an extraordinary... Yeah, it was extraordinary. It was during, I, w I was working for, um, I was based in Mexico as a correspondent for The Guardian and the BBC and um, uh, with the World Cup coming. And during the World Cup, the BBC, um, they always send loads of people out from London to do the work. There wasn't much work that I was going to be able to do, and I was meant to know something about Mexico, um, which seemed a bit of a waste of not being doing, doing anything for the BBC. The I ITV signed me up and allowed me to cross over during the period uh, of the World Cup from the BBC to ITV. Well, halfway through the competition, the Brazilians had the sense that they were going to win that one in 1986. Well, they always think they're going to win anyway, and they always had more journalists than anybody else. It seems half of Brazil was a journalist and half of them turned up to watch the finals and they staged a rest of the world versus Brazil media match. I didn't think it was going to be serious because somebody, when the list came round of who wanted to play, somebody had signed the name Lev Yashin and Lev, I think, was in really the advanced stages of life back home in Moscow and I think it had a leg amputated. So it seemed an unserious game to me. Um, as it was, I signed up with one or two other people for the rest of the world and when we got to the pitch, it was a large uh, stadium in Mexico City. Characteristically, the Brazilians had failed to turn up with a goalkeeper. It's never considered normal or necessary in Brazil to have a goalkeeper. This is why Brazilian keepers are not that good. Everybody wants to be scoring goals like Pelé and Rivellino and all the rest of it. So I was shoved into playing for Brazil. In the dressing room, though, I'd been changing into my boots with the lights of Pushkas. Um, the old Hungarian maestro, who for me was a real, I was certain my father and that generation, remembering how Hungary had beaten England, the first foreign team to beat England at Wembley. The idea of being in the same area as Pushkas was incredible. He was an old man by this time, but he was changing into his gear. Uh, anyway, I went out on the pitch and was in, uh, playing for Brazil and was told by the manager, who was Pele's PR man. Pele had failed to turn up. He had another PR commitment somewhere else. Um, uh, oh, you go and practice in the goal mouth. I don't need to talk to you in the little chat that I'm going to have with the team before. And you go and practice with Mr. Rivellino. They always say that goalkeepers are, are clowns. Um, usually, uh, oh, the goalkeepers are mad. I mean, the proper goalkeeping mentality says that you are the only sane person on the pitch and the rest of the world out there, the team is mad. You have to keep saving them all the time. I don't sort of hold to those old-fashioned stereotypes about clowns and madness. Um... But there is a certain stereotype. To be a goalkeeper, I think, um, doesn't need the exuberant character. Um, it may be good to watch sometimes, the exuberant character and throw himself into a scorpion kick or something. But the exuberant character, say the likes of the Brazilian forward line that goes and scores goals, not the best goalkeeping material. A certain downness is required, and maybe that comes from Scandinavia. Maybe bits of Eastern Europe can replicate that. Certainly the old-style British goalkeeper. But even when you look at some of the best of what, in Britain used to be called continental goalkeeping. I think it does take a degree of concentration and seriousness because you have to maintain your concentration through huge periods of the game when nothing is happening with you. More so now, in the old days, 50s and 60s, when the forwards would break out, be a one-to-one -one with a goalkeeper and the centre forward very, and the striker very regular. Now, technically, it's all tied up in the midfield. The goalkeeper doesn't get much to do. It has to concentrate very hard throughout the periods when nothing's happening. And I think it takes a certain dour type of character. Also, it's a game which values scoring goals. You're the only one, well, the, the defence can go and score goals, but they they, they're there to stop goals, but they go and score goals. The goalkeeper is the only one on the pitch who's there to defy everybody else. It's almost against the complete grain of the game. I think it takes a certain bloody-mindedness to want to be in that position.